Welcome to another Monday afternoon of the Behavior, Evolution, and Culture Seminar Series. Uh, we have the full list of speakers for the quarter. It's up on the website in case you haven't checked it out yet. Um, and uh, to give you a preview of next week, Andrew Dalton is coming from the UCSB Department of Psychology and Center for Evolutionary Psychology. And the title of his talk is Welfare Trade-Offs, Computation, Reciprocity, and Social Emotions. So be sure to join us for that. And uh, this week we have a colleague of Andrew's, also from UCSB, but from the Department of Anthropology, Integrative Anthropological Sciences. Uh, Chris Von Rudin, and he is going to be talking to us about why men seek status positions, seek positions of status and leadership. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for having me here. This is a full crowd, so it's great. Um, as I go through, feel free to ask questions. I uh, understand there's just plenty of time at the end for questions as well, so try to keep it informal. Uh, so the talk today, yes, will be about men, status, and leadership. Um, broadly, I'll look at, look at some data across small-scale societies, but also focus on the group where I've done my dissertation work at Shimani and Libya. I'll talk more about them in a little bit. All right, so generally, why am I interested in social status? I think there are two broad reasons why. One, uh, I think better understanding of how and why individuals signal relative social position uh, can give us better understanding of transitions uh, in social, economic, and political organization throughout human history. Secondly, I think there are also some policy implications. Um, so identifying and preventing arms races over positional goods, um, which could be individually beneficial but collectively harmful, um, I think is a, a hot topic in a society that's increasingly um, unequal. And uh, Robert Frank, the economist at Cornell, has written a lot about that. All right, so before we go any further, uh, there's some general questions I think I should put on the table. One, you know it when you see it, but what is social status? So we hear that, that phrase all the time, what is it, what do we mean by it? So look at these pictures. What do these all have in common? Um, there's Justice Scalia showing his disdain for the world um, dear leader being admired by his uh, uh, other uh, army uh, personnel. And here Gandhi delivering a speech. Uh, P. Diddy getting off out of his personal helicopter. And Mark Zuckerberg, who, if you didn't know he's Mark Zuckerberg, you wonder why that guy started by three attractive women. <laughs> um, so, what, you know, what do these all have in common? Uh, another question put on the table, are status hierarchies universal? So there's evidence that even in highly egalitarian societies um, that lack formalized hierarchies, uh, certain individuals still get the better pick of spouses or take more central roles in decision making. And also, status hierarchies will emerge spontaneously in small group studies. And there's a recent study involving um, Willem here that found that uh, deferred signals are understood by preferable infants. Um, also, is status acquired in the same way in all societies? So, uh, hunting and the, the Kalahari, uh, actually it's a Hadza man, um, or competitive gift giving in Guinea, or oratory skill, are these things, are these skills uh, important to status, act, status acquisition? Everything? How does status acquisition change with social recall? And finally, uh, an important question is, is status a valuable commodity only in societies with accumulable material wealth? So does this status acquisition, given the potential costs, really only pay off in places where you can command the labor of a lot of people, um, build huge monuments, or get access to a lot of mates? So, with those questions in mind, um, my dissertation is going to look at uh, how to elucidate the selective forces that have shaped human status and behavior by studying status in a society uh, that, that has natural fertility, communities of closely related individuals, and production devoid of significant materials for goods. So a small scale society. Um, and how do we measure status in societies lacking formal hierarchies? What combination of traits in this society produces status gains? And does status pay off 
in the society, uh, particularly in terms of lifetime reproductive success, which might have implications for all, a host of things. Um, now, additionally, I'm not going to talk much about this today, but also I'm looking at the effects of modernization on social relationships and status hierarchies within a small scale society. So are we seeing transitions in status hierarchies and how formalized they are, uh, the more exposed communities and societies are to modernization, um, material growth. So things I'm going to talk about uh, from here on out, I'm going to define social status. I'm going to talk about the Chimane, my study site. I'm then going to briefly talk about uh, what produces status in small scale societies, particularly the Chimane. And then to the meat of my talk, so why pursue status or leadership? And I'm going to look at both that, that question proximately and ultimately. Um, ultimately in the sense that I'm going to look at uh, how status begets reproductive success. Uh, and then also, a lot of people in this room are interested in, in evolution of cooperation, collective action. I'm going to look at there are gains to, whether there are gains to status in the context of leadership. So you do individuals who take on leadership roles differentially benefit from that. And I may have time to go into the last bit, um, but I'm not sure. We'll see. Okay. So first, let's define social status. So in anthropology and sociology and psychology, um, status and its analogs has traditionally been defined uh, in terms of their determinants. So there is the dichotomy of ascribe versus achieve status. Uh, Weber has defined authority in terms of the, his, his tripartite definition, charisma, tradition, or uh, authority to the law, rational debate. French and Raven in, in social psychology have these different forms of social power. Um, all these definitions are, are typologies are really defining status in terms of what determines status rather than status per se. So I think components of a more tractable definition of status itself um, should recognize the following things. One, that it's not a static trait, but rather reciprocal power relationships among individuals. Um, that it includes a relative, that it reflects a relative ability to impose costs or confer benefits um, on others. Uh, that was, you know, Henry can get white of a pretty well-cited paper recently. That, that's, that distinction has been around for a long time. Um, and then also perceptions are paramount. So how individuals perceive others uh, is what really counts in terms of status. And um, sometimes, you know, when the rubber hits the road, that's important too, but perceptions really are paramount. How we perceive others in terms of our ability to inflict costs or confer benefits. So this is how I'm going to define status. Um, individuals in a social group assess their own and others' relative ability to confer benefits or inflict costs on group members. Um, and then in order to facilitate exchange or to avoid the cost of repeated contest competition, uh, individuals will cede contested resources, be it food, mates, leadership positions, information, uh, to individuals who are perceived as better endowed, often by, this is often done by deference signals. So social status thus is relative access to contested resources within a social group. Uh, and among most animals, social status, I would argue, largely results from a superior ability to inflict costs uh, on others, uh, also known as dominance. Here's some examples in um, elephant seals and chimpanzees. I should say, though, in chimpanzees, you also see this phenomenon of what we might call a derived dominance, where dominance is a result not just of your own physical ability, but your ability to recruit allies to impose costs on others. Now contrast that with prestige, where um, you know, social status may also result from individual's relative ability to confer benefits on others. And that could include not just knowledge, but also material goods, coordinated leadership, maybe even mate value. Um, and in human societies, this is important uh, because uh, in human societies, uh, social status is often based on prestige. It's due in part to the commodities that have been made available by extensive cooperation, social learning, and cumulative cultural evolution. All right, and before I go further, uh, 
quick note, uh, a quick word about male versus female status hierarchies. So my talk is going to focus on men. Um, now that said, uh, at the outset of my research and in my dissertation, um, I focused empirically on that men, not necessarily theoretically. Um, and you should expect status competition to differ between the sexes. There's been some research on that, not enough, I think. Um, and however, all, despite my focus exclusively on male status hierarchies, uh, I would think that male and female hierarchies are not totally, inter, uh, totally independent of each other. For example, the status of spouses cannot be fully decoupled. So I'll just uh, caveat. Okay. All right, so now I want to talk about the Shimane. This is where I did uh, my dissertation work. <clears throat> I think the Shimane are an interesting case study for studying social organization, status hierarchies, et cetera, for a couple of reasons. One, they complement studies, some well-known studies of status and leadership in more warlike Amazonian societies, <coughs> uh, including the Shawar and the Yonamamo. In Shimane society, there's no recent history of um, intercoalitional conflict. Secondly, uh, the Chimani society is a laboratory of sorts for studying behavioral responses to sociocultural variation. Um, and so modernization, exposure to markets, material wealth is quite heterogeneous both within and across villages. So it makes for a really interesting um, study of change in all kinds, all kinds of things. So the Chimani live in lowland Bolivia. Uh, just beyond the foothills of the Andes, along the Namiki River and in adjacent forests. They are semi-sedentary, and they live in communities that will range from 30 to 500 individuals. Uh, Kin-related families will live in close proximity, and they form well-defined household clusters. And communities are really sort of loose aggregations of extended family clusters. So here's a map. At the bottom, you can see the, this is Bolivia. And that square is this blown up. Um, here, down here is the Andes. And this is a, uh, the Maniki River, along which the Chimani live, flowing down. San Borja there is the site of an original, uh, original Jesuit mission in the area in 1690, I believe. Um, and the communities where I've worked are highlighted here in these red squares. Um, the ones closer to San Borja have experienced a lot more modernization, a lot more individuals have material wealth, whereas the other are a little more remote. In terms of subsistence, uh, families can spend weeks or months on foraging field cultivation trips away from settled villages, and uh, Sweden horticulture of plantain, rice, corn, and manioc is the Consists it's the bulk of their, their diet, but it's also supplemented with fishing, hunting, and gathering. So here's some pictures of the Shimane engaged in productive activities. Some women digging up some uh, tumors. There's an older woman making chicha, which is the alcoholic brew, drunk in a lot of Amazonia. Um, there are some men engaged in fishing. I'm going to talk more about that. It's, it's called barbasco fishing. They use a plant toxin to, to fish. I'll talk about that later with respect to leadership and collective action. There's a guy cutting down a big tree to clear for his, his field. A uh, man with some kwati just killed. And another individual with his bow and arrow. Um, a lot of the hunting now is done with sh uh, shotguns or rifles. But when you can't afford bullets, you have your bow and arrow. So most individuals are still um, quite versatile with bows and arrows and use them fairly frequently. Uh, family organizations, so the Chimane have, um, unlike say other lowland Amazonian groups that have been studied like the Ache, uh, they have very stable pair bonds. Um, they also have extremely high uh, fertility rates. So the TFR for women is approximately nine children. It's quite high. <laughs> uh, polygyny is rare, but it still occurs in around five, around five to ten percent of marriages in more remote communities. Um, and matrilocal postmarital residence is most common. Um, often followed by Neil and Kelly. There's some Chimani families on the bottom there. Um, so I've talked about modernization, and what I mean by that is that there's incipient cattle ownership, uh, wage labor with robbers and ranchers, and produce sales to local markets that are on the rise, as well as access to elementary education. 
Um, and this is particularly for, vis uh, for villages near that, that town of Sambora, I showed you, which was the site of the former Jesuit mission. So a lot of the, for example, individuals that actually are, are have some cattle is because non-shamanic Bolivians will give them some cattle to tend, and they're allowed a percentage of the offspring. So uh, this will have a lot of bearing for it from when I talk about status and what uh, what it gets you in a society. Um, so so politics. So uh, village communities are really a recent phenomenon. And they really have emerged due to outside political pressure for groups and extended families to demarcate themselves as a community. Um, Intervillage disputes are not uncommon, despite the lack of um, really uh, intervillage disputes. But um, these intervillage disputes often concern access to land, um, or accusations of theft, or infidelity. And dispute resolution is typically left to the parties directly involved or less, less frequently adjudicated by an informal gathering of adult men. Uh, there are what are known as village corregidores. They're uh, not chiefs, they're more like correctors. That's the literal translation. So they have no formal power or authority, uh, but they act as representatives to outside political bodies, and they typically have pretty short tenure within communities. Um, Community-wide meetings are happen fairly frequently, and they often will concern the sale of community lumber to logging companies or participation in government or NGO-sponsored development projects. When you say short tenure, what, what kinds of spans are you thinking about? Time span? Yeah. Uh, a year to five years. Okay. Yeah. So there's um, a man at the top who's negotiating a land dispute with some couple of families. Um, here's a village meeting in one of the more acculturated communities with some individuals up front. The corregidor is right here. He's another influential man um, talking to the those who are in attendance. Uh, just a quick picture of uh, the, this is a uh, showing you the percent of the dietic conflicts among men as it pertains to kin relation. So there are a fair amount of conflicts among kin, and conflicts <coughs> among kin occur about two times higher than you'd expect from just random assortment of conflict partners. Um, and a lot of the conflict with non-kin involves access to land, which I mentioned. Mm -hmm. This data was collected through, uh, uh, let's see, in this community it was self-report. Self-report over the last 30 days or the last, the last year? Number? Um, and as I said, you know, the Chimani are really interesting due to the variation across villages. So you can see here the four villages I worked in, different population size, distance to the market town, their general ecology, and uh, the percent of production that's actually sold for income. So um, I may get to this at the end of my talk, I may not, but there's some interesting uh, variants across communities in what predicts status and what status buys you. All right. So now I want to talk about uh, how, do you get, how do you get status in the society. And I'm going to operationalize status among the Chimane with these things in mind. I want to use measures that are going to assay relative resource access, different social scales. Um, also, I want measures that are going to vary in how much they result from an ability to inflict costs versus confer benefits. And that lend themselves to cross cultural comparison. So, it's my view that status is multi dimensional, and so I'm going to want different measures that might capture different accent, aspects of status. So, the two measures I'm going to focus on today are these two uh, the ability of in individuals to win a dyadic physical fight, uh, which might be a metric of dominance. And a second measure, uh, which is whether individuals' opinions carry more weight than others in village meetings. Um, this might be a better metric of prestige, although I should say that derived dominance here, the ability to recruit allies to inflict costs on others, also plays a role in this measure. The way I generate uh, my status measures, a lot of the other measures in this talk, is through photo ranking, uh, which I think is a really useful method because it takes advantage of people's social knowledge. Um, and 
I had all adult men in the community photo ranked by a sample of their uh, within village peers. And I had photos ranked in groups of eight. So not every individual ranked every other individual, every trait. Um, I use a block design sort of such that everybody was ranked for every trait equally, but not everybody ranked everybody. I'm sure they a huge task. Also, I use a lot of economic and demographic to measure reproductive success. And there's some, some data from the Ponza that argues that case. All right, um, I did a little of uh, cross-cultural research um, before I show you the, the status fertility relationship with the Chimane. So across published, well, with published data across foragers and horticulturalists, um, uh, looking across these different proxies for status, so hunting ability, physically formidable, uh, material wealth, and politically influential, in 11 of 15 published cases, um, individuals with more of these traits had more surviving offspring. Um, I, I should say men here. Um, men who had more of these traits, 19 to 22 cases, had higher fertility than other men. And lower offspring um, mortality is rarely described in addition to fertility, but in four or six cases, uh, men who were higher in those things had lower offspring mortality. So uh, in terms of those six pathways identified, well, in those societies, is there any evidence for or against one or more of those pathways that could explain those relationships? Well, in terms of mate access, in seven of 10 cases, men were marrying at an earlier age. Uh, then four or five cases, they were more polygynous. In three of eight cases, they had more serial wives. In three or four cases, they had more extramarital affairs. Uh, in terms of mate quality, in five of 10 cases, uh, their wives were marrying at an earlier age or, or had an earlier age at first birth. Um, uh, in one of three cases, wives had higher BMIs, body mass indices. Uh, in two of six cases, wives were more productive or hardworking. And in two of five cases, uh, the wives had lower interbirth intervals. So, some mixed evidence for effects of inequality and mate access. Yeah, just to interpret the numbers so that, um, that, that for each of those fractions that you've given us, the, the remaining portion is there's no evidence rather than the converse. Exactly. Okay. There's one. One case in all the things, of, uh, uh, all of these uh, studies, where you actually get a negative relationship. That's a recent study uh, done with the Warani by Bickerman, Beckerman, sorry, that found a negative relationship between lifetime fertility and uh, prestige as a warrior, in contrast to the Yana Model case. That's the only published study I've found that actually found a negative relationship between kind of measure of status and uh, measure of reproductive success. Um, allies across these four proxies of status, nine of nine cases, individuals had more trade partners or allies. Six of eight cases, they had more locally recited kin, whether consanguineal or affinal. Um, and now, in terms of father investment, so our high status men also happen to be just better investors in their family. This might be able to test that byproduct question. Well, in two, two, only two of 11 cases was there evidence that father was a better uh, direct parenter, spent more time with kids, etc. And in three eleven cases, was there any evidence that uh, father was a better direct provider if he had to be higher ranked in any of these things? <clears throat> so not great evidence, really that. So to summarize in the, sort of the cross-cultural um, analysis, most studies are fairly selective in the fitness pathways that they report. Um, <coughs> and then higher reproductive success, particularly fertility, um, it, across different proxies for social status. That was a pretty robust finding. The effects of mate access and mate quality on that relationship between status and reproductive, reproductive success was variable. Uh, however, social support was a strong covariant in the studies I found of uh, status and surviving offspring or fertility. Uh, and then higher status men are neither better nor worse direct providers for their families. What about the Chimane? Um, I have a recent paper in my published some data on two villages, uh, 
where I've analyzed the data, and these are the results. So here are my two status measures, wedding fights and community wide influence. For in pair fertility, <coughs> both show a positive relationship. And this is controlling for log of age. These, these are all correlations. I controlled for log of age because some of the, hot, the oldest men showed slightly lower fertility than you'd expect for their age. So using just a linear age control would have uh, been a little problematic. In terms of in pair offspring mortality, there was an effect for influence. Influential men had lower offspring mortality, not for the measure of dominance. Um, both it, men who were more likely to win a fight or had community wide influence had more in pair surviving offspring. Finally, I also have a measure of extramarital affairs um, that was generated by informants. And for both measures of status, uh, there's increased probability of having extramarital affairs. Now, I, uh, I should say that I didn't evaluate any fertility or offspring from affairs due to the risk of over-speculation from informants. I thought that would have been a little problematic. Uh, so I'm only reporting here the fertility and offspring survival within pairs where there's pretty good evidence from demographic interviews that the children are, uh, who, the, are belong to the parents, uh, both the father and the mother, uh, and are not due to some extra main copulation. So there's a graphic representation of the relationship between offspring survivorship and the two status measures. Here's winning fights, there's influence, and divided fights and influence up into quartiles. So here's men in the top quartile winning fights, men in the bottom quartile winning fights. And for each quartile, there are increases in the average surviving offspring. Um, and it's, those are actually residuals from controlling for age. Same thing for influence. Now what's interesting here is, you know, these are pretty large error bars, and it looks like maybe there's just like a step-like relationship between surviving offspring and influence, and more of a winner-take-all kind of effect here for dominance. Or these the three bottom quartiles don't look that uh, different from each other. Okay, so to return to my model, now I want to evaluate these six pathways, among which And I'm going to bring a bunch of different measures to bear <coughs> on the testing that. So, measures I have to test pathway one, better access to mates, include um, marriage age and number of serial wives. And here, outcome variable is only going to be in pairs around the offspring. So I'm not going to look at extramarital affairs. Um, and just a uh, report for each of the, the variables I'm going to show you, their uh, bivariate correlation with surviving offspring. So we see marriage age does have a relationship with surviving offspring. Not a strong one, but it does. Measures of pathway two, so measures of mate quality. Um, I have measures of uh, the age difference among spouses, wife's age at first birth, wife's interbirth interval, wife's attractiveness, uh, the amount of time that wives dedicate to direct parenting or production, uh, the amount of calories that wives uh, produce, and their, af their kin, so men's affine kin, uh, generated by different methods. And you see that um, age at first production is a strong covariate, by very covariate with uh, surrounding offspring and interbirth interval as well. The amount of time wives devote to production, uh, also a strong positive covariate with surviving offspring. Uh, pathway three, so uh, measures of partners and allies. Um, men who are visited more often, who have more allies, who assist them in conflicts, uh, have, have more surviving offspring. Um, other measures didn't show that relationship, including labor, the number of labor sharing partners men have, the number of food sharing partners they have, the time, number of times their family receive food, and the number of daily calories that family receive from other families. Uh, pathway four, difference from competitors. I have two measures here. Uh, the ability of men to get their way in the context of group disputes, and then this uh, respect, measure of respect, which uh, due to some previous analyses I think has a lot to do with uh, the legitimacy with which men achieve power. Um, so these novel forms of wealth, like material wealth, um, do not predict respect, whereas some more traditional 
skills, like hunting ability to do. Um, but getting your way during group disputes does uh, correlate with surviving on screen. Now, I said I wanted to look at whether uh, the status in personal offspring relationship might be due to other factors. Um, and so I'm going to look at whether hunting ability, men's consanguineous kin, and their level of income from horticultural sales and wages um, could mediate the relationship between status and surviving offspring. So does men's productive ability explain that relationship? And as a crude measure of reverse causality, whether men that have larger families are then motivated to gain status, I'm going to compare status and surviving offspring while controlling for current uh, family producer consumer ratio. Um, so the status associated with reproductive success, even independent of current family need. Um, there's some you know, better tests this, but obviously involve causal uh, uh, longitudinal data. And so that's. Uh, we'll leave that for another time. So uh, comparing these six pathways, all right, what's, what's responsible for the relationship I've shown you between those status measures and impaired reproductive success? What I'm going to do is, uh, for all those measures that show uh, significantly correlated with both a status measure and surrounding offspring, we're entered into multiple regression models. And here they are. So those measures that correlated significantly with both the measure of dominance and surviving offspring were entered in the regression model, uh, and nothing really turned out significant. They sort of ate up each other's variance. Um, that said, the, the largest uh, coefficient belonged to getting your way in the context of a group dispute. Um, so uh, that's for dominance. In terms of uh, prestige or community-wide influence, um, the strongest uh, mediator of that relationship turned out to be white age of first birth. So, um, key thing to note here is here are my two status measures, lean back and bites, community-wide influence. They're both here, their uh, slopes are much smaller than where they were in, in bivariate uh, correlation. So, they are being mediated by these other, these other variables. And for influence that seems to largely due to wife's age of first birth. So this is sort of perplexing to me for the following reason. Um, influence doesn't really peak until the late 30s, early 40s. And yet what seems to be a strong mediator of the relationship between influence and surrounding offspring is how young your wife was when she first gave birth. Right? And so uh, men are marrying, you know, 18, 19, 20. How is this you know, what's going on here, my hypothesis is that uh, even at young ages, men's future influence, community-wide influence, prestige, et cetera, is highly predictable, uh, even as an adolescent. Now that said, um, although wife's age of first birth was a very strong mediator of community-wide influence, community-wide influence retained some significance in the model, and um, I didn't include allies in the model here for prestige because it's highly uh, related to community-wide influence. Those two are almost isomorphic. Um, so my conclusion is that wife stage at first birth is the principal mediator of the status fertility relationship for prestigious men, but that allies and social relationships maintain the role as well. Um, in the model, the final model here is directly comparing uh, influence and dominance and influence is mediating the relationship with dominance with surviving hospital. Yeah. Sorry, just quick clarification. You said briefly you mentioned that they were serially homologous, right? Yeah. So is wife's age at first birth the age of their first wife when she gave birth, or their current wife? Age of their first wife. First. Um, there aren't many cases of serial life, actually. Okay. Um, so they tend to pair bond for life? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, um, so there might be some limited evidence still that allies improve fitness even independent of mean quality. Um, but what's interesting here is that influential, influential men's families um, do not receive more calories, protein calories, or total calories per day from other families on average. Despite the fact that high status men are, are more generous with meat sharing and money lending. Um, 
And influ influential men also have more labor partners, but the latter does not significantly correlate with blood type fitness. So uh, what's potentially going on is that high status men's generosity is repaid you know, only during periods of sickness or injury or food shortage because they're not being repaid in the, the short term in kind. Um, alternatively, they might, be, they might be repaid in alternative currencies. Um, John Patton found that uh, meat sharing was used as a, as a tool for getting coalitional support. And so high status men might be generous with food uh, to gain support during community meetings, during land disputes, et cetera. Now, uh, is the status, that status fitness relationship a byproduct? Here, I'm just quickly show you that um, in a model with some of these measures of productivity, hunting ability, um, and also inherited kin network, and horticultural income, these status measures still uh, predict, uh, have the independent effects on surviving offspring. So they're not being fully mediated by any of those measures of productivity. Um, and in terms of reverse causality, is there any evidence that with greater de uh, family demand that men increase their status? And could that be driving the status fitness relationship? Well. Uh, controlling for a log age and household producer consumer ratio, status still predicts compared for some of both of those status measures. All right, so to summarize well, those results, um, there's evidence that status, both measures of status, produce fitness gains both within the paradigm and in the context of extramarital affairs. Uh, dominant men of higher fertility, largely because they are also prestigious. Uh, wife's age of marriage is the strongest status fertility pathway, followed by alliances. Um, direct family provisioning is not driving these results. And generous sharing of meat by high status men is not repaid in kind, at least not over the period of data collection. This points to, or suggestive of out of kind reciprocity, giving as insurance or cost of signal. So there's the. Uh, sort of bolded the significant findings from this model. All right, and then as I said, um, better tests of that model are going to wait longitudinal data analysis. So that's fully covered. Uh, and a final note, um, there's, so there's some evidence for increases in lifetime reproductive success for high status to money men. Uh, what about more long-term directional selection on status relative genes? Well, there's the fertility of fathers and sons are marginally correlated with the um, And this relationship may be stronger for higher status men than offspring. Uh, Brooke has found that uh, high status men may be the really gains of status for their own sons. Um, but we might not expect to see clear genetic signatures of positive selection. For example, if the uh, high status men, their combination of traits represents fitness peaks that are really broken down by the combination subsequent generations. Maybe there's balancing selection that prevents the traits of high status men from sweeping across the population. Or something like reactive irritability might be going on. Something uh, John Toomey and Lee Cosmides have written about, where you might have a trait with uh, zero irritability, um, say condition dependent strategies um, that might be responding to uh, genetic variation in muscle mass. So if you find yourself with more muscle mass, become more extroverted to seek status. But that uh, strategy to respond to muscle mass by itself has zero irritability. Anyways, there's, there's, there's some reasons why we may not expect to see clear signatures on it, uh, positive selection for status relevant traits. Okay, so I'm going to take the last uh, 10, 15 minutes or so to switch gears a little bit and talk about leadership and collective action. So there's evidence here that gains in status lead to gains in lifetime reproductive success. Um, and there's also some evidence that some of this might have to do with alliances, building reputation, et cetera. Um, do some of these gains in, uh, for status occur in the context of collective action? So do high status men take on leadership roles? Do they differentially benefit from these leadership roles? 
uh, whether via direct gains from the collective action or from the reputations that they might develop as leaders. Uh, so, le first of all, leadership might be a solution to a lot of the uh, first order collective action dilemmas, um, how individuals are able to cooperate in groups. So leadership might uh, improve the coordination of individuals um, by leaders making the first move or assigning roles, eliciting ideas or prioritizing ideas and creating consensus. Um, additionally, viewing a sing single individual with monitoring responsibility might provide a clear uh, accounting of contribution levels. There's also some experimental evidence that imbuing a single individual with reward or punishment authority raises mean contributions um, by improving the efficiency of reward and punishment allocation and by limited to limiting retaliatory actions uh, among group members who have punished each other. But, uh, <clears throat> so, Leadership may serve as a solution to first order collective action dilemmas, but the second order collective action dilemma remains, and uh, which is what interests me. So, do leaders, for example, differentially benefit from the collective action? Um, and the way that might, that might happen is through several means. One, they might get a bigger slice of the pie. Two, they might uh, receive direct payment, but in alternative currencies uh, outside of the actual division of spoils. There might be reputational gains, or um, their signaling of their ability as leaders might lead to gains in other domains, or their kin might benefit. Um, another possibility here that might resolve this second order dilemma is that leaders and followers might switch roles across event collective action events, such that the costs of leadership are equally shared over multiple iterations of the collective action. But this assumes that there really are no unique abilities uh, required of leadership. So among the Shimane, there's lots of instances of collective action, um, ranging from uh, collective food production, seasonal barbasco net fishing, dispute resolution, negotiation with uh, loggers and other outside interests, communal trail clearing, uh, and coordinating government-sponsored village projects. So, uh, I uh, looked at some data we have on barbasco fishing. So to describe it quickly, uh, barbasco fishing is when uh, individuals will use a plant toxin and they'll mash up the, the leaves of this plant, put the toxin in the water after building a dam to sort of to hold water in a certain area. And the plant toxin diffuses through the water. The fish asphyxiate when they encounter this toxin and rise to the surface, at which point they're clubbed or just snatched out of the water. Doesn't kill the fish, but it asphyxiates them. Um, so this requires a lot of coordination. It requires individuals to get the, t the toxin, to produce it, to manufacture it from the plant, um, to build this dam, uh, to get everybody together, to communicate, etc. There's a lot of coordination required. Um, so uh, I looked at the different instances of barbasco fishing in Chimane to see if leadership, uh, there were any gains to leadership in the context of barbasco fishing. And uh, one out of three barbasco events involves more than one household. And organizers of these barbasco events, who are coordinating activities of others within the barbasco event, were named in 39 multi-household barbasco events, um, for which I knew the fish catch for all participants. So the average group size of these Rabasco events is five and a half, um, but it ranges, the average number of households per group is 2.7, and the average number of organizers per group is 1.69. So it's not the case that there's only one organizer all the time. So that's the most, that's the, the mode number of organizers, but not the case all the time. And I found that controlling for the number of participants per household, organizers' households do not receive more fish by weight than the average household return. They're not getting a bigger slice of the division spoils. Um, is there any turn taking then in Barbasco leadership? Well, I found that um, looking at all those individuals who participated in more than one uh, multi household Barbasco event and who were named as an organizer in at least one of those events, um, that among all those individuals, only four pairs ever reciprocated roles. Meaning one person was an organizer, or one person wasn't, and then a subsequent Barbasco event. The person who wasn't an organizer now is. 
So turn taking doesn't seem to be driving this uh, or explaining the reason why individuals would take on the cost of um, taking on more vascular leadership. The final thing I want to talk to you about today is this collective action experiment that I um, came up with to look at whether leadership can potentiate collective action, improve coordination, and whether there are gains to leadership. Um, and so I used a couple of uh, games that require coordination and problem solving. These are sort of live action games um, that you know, corporate teams have used, Boy Scout groups have used, and uh, they're called the spiderweb game and the river game. I'll describe them briefly in a second. But for each game, if the group of seven Shimane men completed the game in under 10 minutes, they got a 40 Bluvion of payout. Um, that's the local currency, and uh, it's about five dollars. And they would have to split that among them. If they failed to complete the games in under 10 minutes, they would get half that to split them among them. Um, for one of their two games, the groups were asked to choose a leader who would have say over the division of spoils. The spiderweb game, basically you have a team of individuals, everybody has to get to one side of this web of ropes to the other side. The rules are you can't touch any of those strands. If anybody touches any of those strands, the whole team has to return to the first side and start again. Um, second rule is that you can only use one hole per person. So not everybody can go through the same hole. So there's, there's problem solving involved in this, as well as coordination. Um, here's a quick picture of the Chimani. They love these games. Uh, the second game I used was called the River Game. Basically, there's a field with uh, 12 bricks that are placed at intervals across the field. And the team of seven individuals has three planks. And they have to use these planks to get from one brick to the other without touching the ground at all. Um, if anybody touches the ground at any point, the whole team returns to the first brick. Um, that's basically the rule there. The trick to this one is there's a point where you have to do what these guys are doing, and you can't just go brick to brick to brick, but you actually have to use your planks to bisect an existing plank. So again, there's requires problem solving. Or the Chimonic game. And after each game, uh, there was a division of spoils where if they won, they completed in under 10 minutes, they got a 40 Bolivian on payout. If they didn't, they got a 20 Bolivian on payout. If it was a leader condition, which I alternated, um, then the leader could determine how to divide up the spoils. If not, their group pay was on the table, and I just said, here is your reward, and then I let, let them divide it. So look to see how, uh, look for endogenous or emergence of any kind of distribution model. So this experiment offered a lot of interesting things. Um, you could look at how leadership and reward distribution merge endogenously. There's natural variation in individuals' knowledge and ability. There's no anonymity. This will have reputational effects. Production requires problem solving, and rewards are not windfalls. That said, that's a lot to pack into an experiment, and that said, it's not the best experiment. Um, but I think this kind of open-ended uh, game um, can provide important lessons for how to develop future experiments. And I think starting from the most control and going up is one way other ways to just be completely open-ended and work down. Uh, there is evidence that teams of leaders perform better. They completed the games faster. Chris, if you assign a leader, you could just say there's going to be a leader, you know, beside yourself. Exactly. exactly. Um, so, so each there are six teams. This is a very small end. This is just for preliminary work. But um, it seems that the leader condition here, average completion time was much faster than the games without leaders. Um, looking at who was nominated as leaders, they tend to be individuals who, first of all, in all these traits I looked at, they were all ranked above the mean, the group mean. And that what really emerged is they tend to be dominant individuals, but also individuals who are known to be trustworthy. So it wasn't just that they were big, formidable, they also were trustworthy individuals. So here's the question um, I really want to ask. Do leaders differentially benefit um, from the division of spoils? Well, the 
the strong result here is that across all the games, every single division of spoils involved the same result, which was that six players got an equal payout and one player got a smaller payout. They really sought hard how to divide equally this payout. And I made sure, you know, 20 or 40 divided among seven is not going to give you equal payouts, um, given the, the currency I gave them. Um, but they really worked hard to try to figure out how to make sure it was equal. Even where some people were definitely taking on leadership roles and other people were sort of short game. I looked at what constitutes for writing these games too, but I won't talk about that. So, uh, two out of six times, uh, leaders gave themselves the smaller payout. Um, this did not really track how the team performed. But I also looked at the most influential member of the group, as determined by my, my photo ranking, and uh, the most influential members of the group tended to receive less when the group lost. And some things that, that these people were saying, some of the influential people were saying, when I asked them why they took less than others, um, they didn't want to be seen as greedy, they wanted the others to receive more, they hoped others would win, didn't want others to be angry, etc. Okay, so I'm going to skip through this again and go to my group. So, uh, what to take away from this? One, that even in egalitarian societies, status has direct lifetime fitness effects. And that I found increases in both in-pair and extra-pair reproduction uh, within the Chimani. And that in-pair fitness gains of high-status Chimani men are due more to social alliances and life's age than to direct provision by either spouse. And I think Chamani men and men in other societies uh, seek status and leadership to bolster their reputations. Not for immediate gain, but for long-term dividends in not just in the currencies in which they're um, currently cooperating. <coughs> so I found that the generosity of high-status men is not been paid in kind, it's not in the short term. And leaders in both the context of the basketball fishing or collective action games are not differentially benefiting from the direct material payouts. So the reputations are what's at stake here. And that's it.